In this episode, I talked to Joe Coniglione, who was the principal of the high school that I went to when I was in high school, and now he's the assistant superintendent. And he talks to me about all of the things that he's learned in his life, becoming in the position he is now. This is someone who has an amazing, he has amazing emotional intelligence, and I think we have a lot to learn from him. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you do, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to stay up to date on my channel. And I hope you enjoy. this damn record button i use skype i don't use like zoom or anything you use skype. yeah we're used to zoom and uh, google meet so it just took me a little bit to get on <laughs> <laughs> the thing with this is skype is free to record whereas zoom and google meets you need to like pay you gotta right. pay to use the recording function so f that i'm not doing that yeah, i don't blame you so how are you doing you're it home good. right now i just walked in yeah I had to run and grab my daughter out of school, drop her off at her mom's, and we're back. Got it. Got it. When do you when when is your uh, when do you work out during the day? You're you're Actually, five days a week. So what is soon it as the morning? I'm done, as soon as I'm done with this. Oh. Yeah, I'll I see. go pick up my other daughter and we go to the gym. Got it. You got two daughters? Yeah. Got it. Seventeen and ten. What an age. Me at seventeen. Ooh. Yeah, I remember it well. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. So how you doing? Things are really good, man. How about yourself? Things are going well. Doing all right. Yeah. Good. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for yeah, coming on the Hidden Doors podcast. That's great. Yeah. So, um, the reason I have you on here, I told you this. We were talking. We were talking a little bit before when we met each other at the school. But I try to. The whole point of this podcast is to try to like one inspire, but then two give people like practical ways that they can find success in their lives and everyone has different things everyone's got someone wants to be a lawyer someone wants to be just obviously there's many different paths in life but someone might look at you and say how the hell do i get in that position how like what the hell did he do to get there and you know believe we were talking about this but some people don't realize that you know sometimes you don't have everything figured out and sometimes you have you're a normal person who goes through regular challenges and you have a goals and you fight through it and and maybe you have a goal of being in the position you are now, but people don't really know the exact path. Right, exactly. Like like we had Travis Frank. You know Travis Frank. Sure. I had Travis Frank on the podcast just to talk about how he became a lawyer. I had no idea. And maybe who's someone who is gonna go down that path can now learn how to do it. So I, I try to I try to give people practical practical lessons and i love having people come on where we can all learn from and i think and i think people can learn a lot from you um yeah you I'm for not you so sure about that <laughs> i don't know my view of you is that yeah you have like your emotional intelligence and your way that you connect with people is like probably the best you could get. Like you could connect with someone who was on the school board, an executive, and then all the way down to a high school kid like me. Like I felt like when I was connecting with you and talking to you when I was in high school, it's like it you know, it just felt different. It felt like you were you had you were like aware of how I felt. You you just have a, a good way of connecting with people. And so I think everyone who Probably everyone who ever has interacted with you can feel that. So I think we have a lot to learn from you, actually. And we have a lot to learn from your damn exercising routine. What the <laughs> hell do you do? My daughter keeps me in shape. That's the key. Listen, I have a 17-year-old daughter who dates. Got it. <laughs> Got to stay on top of your game. Uh, <laughs> you know, the reality is I feel like you're never better than anybody else. You know, and everybody goes through something in life. Um, and I've been there. You know, I was a 17-year-old kid, and I haven't forgotten the challenges that I went through when I was a teenager. Um, I wasn't always a great student either. You know, and I think 
having that and, and having the people who have been influences in my life, uh, you know, helped tremendously. And I think probably the, the most important thing, if you can have it, is empathy. You know, that's it's it's an invaluable characteristic that uh, allows you to, to feel what the other person's feeling. Is this something that you've always really good at or did you develop it over time? I think as I got older, um, I just grew into someone. Uh, my parents are empathetic and, and, you know, so it was probably ingrained in me from when I was young. Um, I remember growing up, my parents always talked about we want to be foster parents. We want to adopt kids because we want to be able to give them home. So I think I grew up in an environment where it was about helping other people uh, and giving them a better life for themselves. Um, I didn't always want to be a teacher. You know, I had I ran an automotive business for a very long time. And I thought that was my path to own my own career. I did sales. I tried everything. Um, I started college. I wanted to be a psychologist. You know, I, that's that was my thought process. And as I was there, I was miserable. I hated it. Um, when I trained, changed over to education, that's when things shifted for me. Um, I just became very successful in college. My grades went through the roof. And uh, I, I loved what I did. I, I could say up until I've been doing this now. This is my 20 sixth i believe year in education and i feel like i started yesterday so it's like once you find that thing that you love to do it doesn't like it doesn't feel like you're working i guess it's just like you're so passionate about it that you can wake up early go to bed late although sometimes you can't do that every time but you're when you're passionate about something that you do for a living it brings the best energy out of you i would say absolutely yeah you never feel like you're going to work. You, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get, when I was a high school principal, I could not wait to get to work. I was there at five 30 in the morning every day because I was so excited to be there. But also think about it. Like what I got to do every single day was hang out with kids, you know, like kids and, and, and have conversations and, and learn about their lives. And, and as much as I may have influenced them, there were so many that influenced me as well. Um, we had started a leadership program. I guess it was about, principal maybe for about two or three years called leap uh, and it all started with a group of kids that we had gone to a conference together a leadership conference and it was you know mediocre it was great you know it was nice uh but nothing like overwhelmingly influential uh, we got back to the school and there were police across the street they had uh, found that a house a vacant a vacant house which they thought was vacant had been vandalized um and uh it turned out that the person was living in Florida, but selling the home. So it was just empty. The kids came up with the idea to go and redo the house as students because it was a group of teens, some from within the district, some from without, uh, who had vandalized it. So our students wanted to make the difference and say, you know what, we're going to help that family out. And to see those kind of things happen, you know, you could be the greatest adult in the world and it has a tremendous impact. Yeah. Uh, we, we had one year when uh, the hurricanes hit um, Puerto Rico. One of the students came to me and said, I want to do a food drive. I know they're having trouble getting food to Puerto Rico. We were able to ship over. It was something like 46 tons of food to Puerto Rico. It's a lot. It, it was tremendous. Like the entire stage of the high school and all the aisles were filled with waters and food. And we had to have uh, – actually, you know, who flew it over was uh, Fat Joe was uh, had called and said – we couldn't get a plane to take it over. He's like, I'll fly it over. Like, Wait, it all just Fat started. Joe? Yeah, the musician. Really? Yeah. Just, I mean, we got calls from people from the Jets and anyone trying to help. Just by one kid saying, you know what? I want to do this. So it takes like you, just like you say, you know, you've got to take that first idea and then you just take steps one step at a time. And eventually it catches on. Your leader, that's the lead program that did all this? Yeah. That's pretty impressive. It was awesome. Uh, a leadership program with high school kids got the attention of a, na a national football team, uh, a, a probably globally known musician. Yeah. 42 ton 46 tons or 42. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was, it was definitely, I mean, we had every politician that showed up to, to be a part of it after it grew on so big because the news took it on. Uh, mm. it, uh it was one heck of a drive, you know, and, and uh, they actually, the mayor of the town in Puerto Rico uh, named the day after the students. 
which was kind huh. of cool. So they got a proclamation. It was really nice. How do you name it after all the students? Are yeah, there like 10 the, students? The, the Tomswag Warrior. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my, my um, heater is on. Do you hear any background noise? Not at all. All right. Well, that's amazing. That's uh, I did did not. I knew there was a leadership program. I did not know they were making that big of an impact. That's uh, I wish I was doing that in high school. That's awesome. Yeah. So you were you were doing a lot of different types of jobs before you uh, got into teaching. Sure. I so my big thing here is I think. S- yeah, I'd like to get your perspective on this. I think learning sales is very an important skill set for people. Uh, one, I think it just like I have a big I, I have a saying where it's like I think everyone should try to run their own company because I think you realize how difficult it is if you if you get out of college, work for these huge companies who have almost guaranteed sales to a certain extent. You start taking that stuff for granted. You might get a little too cocky. And when you start your own business, for me, I wrote my own book. I have my own podcast. It is very difficult to get a large number of people to want to hear you, listen to you, buy your book. And it humbles you and it makes you like work harder and realize – and I think it grounds you more. And then with sales, it's like – I think there are certain things with sales that I wish like maybe co- all college – I wish I did it out of college. Yeah. There's just a lot of things that just help you – it's similar to like running the business where it's like you don't take things for granted. You got to work your ass off. You have to learn to deal with people. You need to learn how to speak to people and to sell it and to sell you just cause you're not selling a product. I don't think that necessarily means you don't sell like it, to people to listen to this podcast. I'm doing a little bit of selling. I'm, I'm marketing myself a little bit. So do you find that your sales experience was helpful for you? Yeah, Chris, and it's something that you, you have. It's it's the ability to communicate, you know, and you, you've always had that. You've always been very personable and charismatic. So that is uh, one, it's, you know, communication is definitely the key. The, the ability to talk to people and listen to them um, and not force the conversation, because once you start to force it, that's when you turn people off. Uh, but you're right. Uh, sales, owning your own business, all very humbling experiences. Um because it can go, it, it, everything is on your shoulders. It's not just handed to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's, that's the key. Cause if you, you know, and I tell my kids this all the time, you could have anything given to you, but you'll never appreciate it as much as if you worked for it. It was never really yours unless you earned it. Yep. And sometimes things aren't given to you though. Right. In most cases, things aren't just given to you. So you that's can, the- I have a thing like you build your own luck. You can sit on the couch all day and do nothing. And you will not get lucky, but someone who's out there working hard every day is going to be a higher chance of getting lucky. And then maybe someone wins the lotto and things are handed to them, but that's very unrealistic in life unless like you're coddled as a kid and your parents are really wealthy. But that's not the, that's not the majority of people in this country or world. Right. Well, let's be honest. Luck is really about preparation, determination, and that's when you get luck. It's it's hard work that you put in. You know, it doesn't just happen. Yeah. So do you miss being a principal? Ah, every day, every day. There's (laughs) nothing better than waking up and having conversations and greeting people in the morning and, and, you know, having the ability to say, you know, how can I help you? What can I do to make your life a little bit better? Um, And you have a direct impact on individuals. So in the position I'm in now, I may have an impact, but it's a little bit more like of an umbrella where when you're the principal, I can go to one person and directly impact that person. Uh, yeah, there's not there's not a better feeling in the world than being able to do that. Do you go back to the high school or or the school sometimes <laughs> and today. just like chat with the kids as much as I can? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and obviously, you know, there are times that, you know, things get with COVID and the way things are going. Uh, everybody in, in education, their jobs have changed drastically. Kids, you know, as students, it's changed drastically. Uh, whether you're in school, you're, you're virtual. It's and let's be honest, nobody really wants to be virtual. It, it Education is about connections. You know, it's about building relationships with teachers and and teachers getting to know the students and the students work harder because they know their teachers and they value their teachers input and the teachers care about the kids. Um, That's what makes education successful. Uh, So when you 
put in a pandemic, it, it takes a little bit of that away, unfortunately. So it's much more difficult to build those relationships. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I go back as much as I can because uh, that personal contact and connection, it, it's so valuable. Yeah, I'm sure you're the I'm sure you're the hero back there. The, no, I'm sure they miss you. So many. There's so many great people there. So it's like, and you know, and everybody says like the high school was a great place. It really was. We had some of the best, and I taught, you know, in other districts. I've worked in other districts. I can honestly say that the teachers at that high school are probably some of the best teachers I've ever seen in the world. Um, they're just amazing. The, the ability that they have to care for kids and genuinely connect with them, and it's, it's unbelievable. So what what's your title right now? Like what is it? Assistant? It, it, will you tell me? Yeah, it's assistant superintendent for staff and student services. So basically, anything that does with deals with students and staff is kind of falls into my role. And then you have another assistant superintendent who deals with all of the curriculum and instruction. So Got it. Two very different roles, but two extremely important. <laughs> I, when you were like, when you said I wanted to be a teacher, or even when you were teaching. Was this like a role that in your head you said you were going to – because some people teach for – like you just love teaching. And you just teach. And then – what is – I guess what is the step to becoming like in your level? Because first yes. you got to be a principal, right? Then you got to – but do you have to be a teacher to be a principal? Yes. Yeah. So, well, you can get an administration degree now. Um, when I started – so I, I wasn't going to be a teacher like I had said to you. Um, I really just, you know – was never a thought process. Um, I had a cousin who was uh, uh, mentally retarded at the time, and uh, I just loved being around him. And he was, you know, so I said, oh, "Let me try it, special education." I went to college, got a special education degree, got hired at Brentwood. I taught um, almost every level in Brentwood, and uh, got involved in coaching. Um, I had a great mentor there who uh, who encouraged me to become an administrator. Um, they gave me a, a night. Uh, leadership role as a teacher there. Um, so I ran that for f about five years and uh, decided, you know what, I had went back to college, got another degree um, in administration, both building level and district level. Um, started to apply, uh, got very lucky to end up at Comswag with, you know, I was hired by Dr. Rella, who became, you know, a, a tremendous mentor of mine. And if you know anything about leading with kindness, um, he is the epitome of that. Um, and I, then, you know, Dr. Quinn came in as the principal. I was the assistant principal because Dr. Rella had gone to district office. And, uh, again, same thing where it was just how you, you have great mentors who, you know, really just help you grow and find who you really are and allow you to be who you are in your role. Uh, and I think when that kind of happens and you have the, the ability to bounce back, but also the flexibility to say, Go for it. Try it out. See how it works. Um, failure was, you know, it was okay. It was, it was, it was not seen as um, a problem. It was seen as, okay, you failed, but what did you learn from this? And now let's make growth and move forward. Uh, so working in that kind of environment, and I've been fortunate enough to do that throughout my career, and I think that helped a lot. Yeah. Mentors are like, it's any, anything you do in life, any career, doesn't have to be a career. You could be a kid. Mentors are so important, Absolutely. and the 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 environment they foster with. I love that the environment that you've had was just like you can fail, but you got to go at go after it. People, especially even me, when I was younger, so afraid of failing, as if as if you failed this one thing that you went after, it was gonna like determine your entire life. Like, oh, I failed at one little thing, and I'm. I'm a failure. Like everyone probably thinks I'm horrible. It could be scary. Like, and yeah. you, you prevent, you prevent taking that first step. Yeah. Hey, Chris, you know, you're an author. So, so you would appreciate it. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Sir Ken Robinson, the element. So he talks a lot about um, people who are not successful in school or not successful in certain areas. And they've grown to be some of the most successful people in the world. Um, the, the gentleman who created the Simpson, which the Simpsons, which was probably one of the longest, uh, running TV series ever in history, failed art in school. <laughs> so Michael Jordan got cut from yeah. his <laughs> basketball. 
Like these are people that turned out to be some of the greatest and most successful people in the world, but they had failure. And if you talk to them, and I know, you know, if you heard any of the, um, the uh, conversations with Michael Jordan, failure is what got him to where he was because he learned from his experiences. So failing, like you said, it's not a bad thing as long as it's a learning experience for you. You can't fail and give up. You have to fail and learn. And yeah. then that's when success happens. Yeah. You find that if you're in an environment where your mentor or let's say they're not, maybe they're not a mentor. If your boss is fostering an environment that's like highly critical and you feel like you can't take a step, I don't even know if you call them your mentor anymore. It's like your no. freaking dictator. <laughs> you, have to be, you have to be in a place where you're, it's safe to fail, but to fail forward. You know, um, it, it, you can't be in a place where if you fail, you feel like you're under the gun all the time. That's not a healthy environment to work in. Nobody yeah. wants to work in that kind of environment. Do we sometimes have to? Yeah, you do. You know, it's just that's the reality of things. But if you could put yourself – and if you love your career enough, somehow it works out. So you went back to school to get the degree to be a administrator. Correct. How was that experience like? How long did it take to go – you went back to school. Did it take like another couple of years? Yeah, well, you know, when you're a teacher, if you want to – just to be a teacher, you have to go back and get your master's. I mean, now they do like five-year programs where you can get your master's in, while you're doing your uh, undergrad. And then you'd go back. And it's usually about another two, two and a half years um, to get the degree. And then you take the exams. And then you have to get um, you have to get a job within five years to, to maintain the certification. So it's not terrible. It's not really difficult. The nice thing about the, the administration degree when I went and got it, it was very practical. Um, so the work was practical. So you learned, you learned from it. I, so, yeah. you know, some college, you, I didn't, I don't know what the hell I learned from my business administration degree. Like I couldn't, uh, yeah. Some people say you, you, you learn to learn and that's great. But like, I love practical stuff. I want to tell me what the hell to do so I can be better and be prepared for this. So you're saying this is actually practical stuff. Yeah. So a, a lot of the work was field work. So you're in the job doing the work and then writing about what you've done, Got so it. which you, it doesn't get more valuable than that. You know, that's why I think I, what I'd like to see happen, and, and we're going to start working towards now, and we are, we're building a great business program at the high school. There's internships. Kids are actually building real businesses. I mean, you should come by and check it out. Um, we have a class right now that Mr. Mosca brought in uh, called Virtual Enterprise. The kids start their own corporation. They have a CEO. They have a financial department, and they choose it. They keep the books. They do paychecks. They do uh, pitches to companies, taking out loans to, to build real product. It, it's the most amazing thing you'll ever see in your life, and the kids love it. It's it's probably one of the best courses I've ever seen because it's so practical. What made you think of that? Like Because here here's the issue, right? It's like I'm going to make up a number. I have no idea what the number is. Let's say 70 years ago when you got out of high school, it was like you were ready for a full-time job. You were prepared. They gave you the tools to prepare. And now you get out and you're still prepared to take a full-time job on. And, and there's certain like what – there's like certain programs that you can go outside of school. But a lot – a large majority of the pressure is to go to college or some kind of university, which is a lot of them grossly – expensive for an average family um right now <laughs> yeah and so the big opportunity was teach teach people in high school like how to go out and live life and 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 be successful without needing two hundred thousand dollars if they if they didn't you know if everyone has a different path that you don't have to go to college right. to to right. one of these is definitely not for everyone and and now more than ever um you can be so successful without college if you really if that's your choice if you have a skill or a trade um one of the things that we really focus on and BOCES always existed back in the day and there are students that go to you know technical trade schools and and we still have that uh, a lot of the things that we've done now too is um about i guess about like six seven years ago uh dr l and i and and a couple of other administrators started talking about having our classes be problem-based learning classes rather than just straight instruction so kids were applying it to real world situations. So instead of doing a geometry lesson, it might be, here's a land layout and we want you to use geometry to develop a parking lot and maximize the number of spaces. 
So we're getting stuff from an architect and having the class do that. So they're applying the skills to real life situations. And I think that the collaboration skills, the real life skills that we're teaching now, um, I think that's giving our students a little bit of a leg up now. It's like similar to Elon Musk. Elon Musk has, has a school and it's like all about problem solving, like let you think and not just like throw and cram information in your brain and you're rem remembering definitions and, and stuff and you're not critically thinking. That's sure. interesting. I would, I, to be very honest with you, I have no idea how like curriculum works. I would always think it's like top down, not even from your administration, meaning like the state government, like New York state, like right. do you have the, do you have the flexibility to make real time adjustments based on how your kids are learning without having to go through so many channels of bureaucracy? Yes and no. Uh, we're hoping to get there entirely. Um, what we're, what we have to do is kids have to be prepared to pass the exit exams, which in, in New York is are the regions. Uh, if they don't pass the regions, they can't graduate from high school and get a diploma. So I think the difference now is we're taking this type of instruction, the PBL instruction, using the curriculum as the guidance for it, and then taking a, a lesson and saying, okay, how can we take this lesson and apply it to a real world situation where they still retain the information they need to know for the region exams, but also to apply it to real life. We're Got hoping it. to get to a point where region exams may no longer be needed to be taken, where they can do real life projects. And this came out years ago. There was uh, I forgot what conference I was at and they had a guest speaker and he was talking about, he was a physics teacher and he had finished his AP physics class. And he said to his students, but there was a month left because AP physics, the, re the, the exam was earlier on. So they had a month and a half of school left rather than just doing busy work. He said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I want you to go out to the community. I want you to find a problem and I want you to bring it back and we're going to come up with a solution for it. So they had found a young boy who uh, had a stroke. He was probably, 10, I think he was 10 years old. So he couldn't ride a bicycle because he couldn't keep his balance. So they came up with an idea of how to build a self-balancing bicycle in this physics class. They ran a tube through it, and as the weight shifted, it pushed the other weight from the inside of the tube to the opposite side to balance it out. So the kid was able to – and then the whole town came together, and the kid rode his bicycle. Hearing that was like – and Dr. L and I were like, this is what we want to do. You know, this, this is the type of education we want kids to do. Take real-world problems. Take what you've learned. And then apply it to that. I love I that. That's the goal. That's the goal behind PBL. Interesting. Seems like you're already doing it to a small. It seems like you're already doing it, but it seems like you want to maximize. You want to even outdo yourself even more. And, yeah, and we started. We started with like basic stuff at the high school and getting it done and doing it. And then uh, Dr. Polly Kronakis, who is the uh, other assistant superintendent for curriculum, she has taken it to a whole new level, um, where teachers are really understanding the planning process of it and how to implement and how to get kids to the highest level of PBL. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. And, you know, when we, we were doing really well and then COVID hit. So it was a little bit of a setback, getting kids back into school, just getting used to being back in the classroom. Uh, that's been a little bit of a challenge. Now we just met the other day and we're, we're moving forward with that all over again. So, uh, you know, I expect great things out of it. I do. Let me ask you this. Co uh, all the, COVID being as bad as it was, and there's a lot of bad things that happened. Um, the silver lining from one aspect is that from people who are working a lot and traveling to work and who work in offices have more flexibility. And it seems like, like for me, uh, it seems like a lot of companies in my industry, I work in advertising, will adopt a more flexible work environment, meaning you can go to the office if it's necessary and if you can stay at home if you have the equipment to do so as long as the business is meeting its needs and that might mean one to three days a week depending on your team or whatever but it saves time commuting it helps you help take care of things at home if you have a kid and it just helps people be more autonomous now with the school it's like almost opposite because people learn better in the school so is there any kind of permanent change you see that's going to happen in the school? Or is it like, hey, once we get this thing under control and we're ready to go, we're going back in. I mean, you're probably already going back in, but like you're going back into normal ways of operating. Or is there ever like a virtual learning thing yeah. that could happen in, in like like work like offices are doing like in professional environments? So in the educational process piece, I think the one 
big factor is when students are out of school, they're able to not miss. So if a student is out um, due to, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything like serious, like a flu. If you're, if you're that sick, you're not getting on virtually and doing it because you need to rest. But if they're home with, you know, they have uh, chicken pox and, and they're okay, but they just can't be around people, they can log in virtually and still be a part of a classroom virtually so that when they return to school after the virus is, you know, cleared, they're not that far behind. You know, clearly virtual education does not fill the void. It, if you don't have relationships and you don't have connections, you can't perform to your highest levels. And in education, if you're not performing to your highest levels, what's the point? You, the, the point is to maximize and, and get the most out of each student. And that's what a teacher's job is. Not just yeah. to provide instruction, but to maximize the potential for those kids. Um, so it's, you know, sometimes it's hard because you have different levels of interest in a classroom. And a teacher has to balance, how do I get this student who is less motivated than this student to perform the same? So sometimes the conversations have to vary and they have to, they have to differentiate for those kids. Um, but the big piece, like I said, is students can still attend class even when they're not there. And I think that's going to be a huge piece moving forward. Uh, students who, you know, may be out of school for five days for whatever the reason, they can still attend that class and not miss instruction. Interesting. So your classrooms are set up for virtual? Yeah, we had to do it. When, when the pandemic hit, we went to shutdown. Uh, we had to come up with a way to teach students within days. Interesting. Uh, we had we had meetings almost 24 hours a day, and uh, we came up with a plan. Uh, we got a plan together. We were able to deliver Chromebooks to families at home. We did some pickup. We did deliveries. We did it any way we could. Uh, we fed probably 1,500 meals a week. We were handing out meals at the school uh, during COVID. It, like, it was a time where you really saw like everyone just pitches in. Forget what any whatever problems there are. We're a community. We're going to figure this out. And we did it. Yeah. You usually find when it's, when, when shit hits the fan, you, the, the, uh, it's, it's easy to be a good leader when everything is going well, but you usually find who the bad leaders are when shit hits the fan. And I'm sure a lot of bad leaders were exposed in these last 18 <laughs> months. It seems I'm like you guys sure. had your, it seems like you guys were doing good. Yeah. You know what? We have an, we have an amazing team there. I mean, I don't know what elementary school you went to, Chris. Where'd you, where'd you Clinton, go? Clinton. Clinton. So you had Miss Bifalco, who she's a superstar, you know, and it, it, we have so many uh, administrators there who are just like, and everybody brings their special talent. Uh, so we work, and, and I think that helps. We work well together um, when we have a, a challenge and we know someone that has a strength in that. We have the ability to communicate and work together and collaborate. And it, it, it's a unique place to work. It really is. So this is a silly question, but I have no idea how school board school boards work. Like, I w we I just was at the school board uh, the other day with yep. you. Um, who are all those people? Like, are they elected? Or yeah, are they so appointed? They are they're elected uh, officials who volunteer to. And the the, the goal of a school board is to create policy for districts, and and make sure that the policy gets implemented. Um, I, I know this well because I was a school board member in Rocky Point for a year. Um, I decided to give it a shot and uh, I hated it. It's probably the most thankless job anyone will ever do in their life. You deal with every single problem. People are picking on you because they think that you're – and people have this misconception that they get paid. They do not get paid. And the amount of time and hours that they put in – like we talk to our school board probably 10 times a day. They have their own careers, their own jobs, their own families. They're just doing this to volunteer because they have a special interest in the success of students in our district. Um, so it takes a really special person to be a school board member. And I can tell you, I was on a school board. I worked in other districts. We probably have one of the best, most supportive school boards um, who genuinely, a lot of times you get members who come in and they just want to see, well, my kid plays this sport. So I want to make sure, sure this sport gets everything they need. I can honestly tell you, there's nobody on the school board with an agenda. They genuinely want the best for kids, well, but all kids, some wants, you know, are, are focused towards sports, but all sports, it's never just one, uh, some are music. Okay? How do we build a music program? And these are the conversations that they have. Um, so they're an, they're an impressive group of individuals and, and the amount of time that they sacrifice is, I, I don't know how they do it. 
that changes my whole perspective on who the board is. I when I was I saw the board, it was like, who are these people? Like, are these they're getting didn't from my point of view, it didn't seem like it seemed like they had to when I was there uh, maybe all agree to a certain bunch of few policies, but mm-hmm. it, it was like I was like, are these people getting paid a lot of money to do this right now and so it changes my whole perspective on it now they're like really amazing people yes exactly what about the president though the president so again elected within the school board so the school board decides who they feel should be the president uh so you met mrs gordon yep um probably one of the most intelligent women i've ever met in my life uh she has a great balance about her uh she has a great leadership style um, she is all about equity and the best for children. Um, and, and quite honestly, it's, that's the foundation, you know, how yeah. do we make things best for each kid? Um, she's very open and willing to, you know, say, okay, how do we, how do we make this happen? And what can I do to help? Um, she, you know, it, it's rare to find people like that who are willing to do so much for other kids, not their own. She doesn't have any children in the district anymore. Her kids all graduated. So for her to still sacrifice her time shows you that it's never been about anything other than the good of the community. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I wonder, I wonder what other boards are like, like some corrupt boards. I am curious if there are, uh, there's gotta well, be some are. out there. A hundred percent are, you know, we, we see it all the time. Unfortunately, um, it's just, you know, you know, and I, I can't say, you know, good or bad about anybody else because I wasn't there. Um, yeah. I can tell you, at Comswag, since I've been here, it's always been this way. Um, it, it's a very unique community where people genuinely care about the success of other kids as well. They want the best for everybody. Uh, and quite honestly, it's it's the reason I'm still there. You know, I mean, opportunities always come up if, if you want to go somewhere. I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. It's, That's it's awesome. An amazing, it's an amazing place to work. How far away do you live uh, from your office? About 20 minutes. It's not bad. Got it. Yeah, not bad. That's beautiful. It is. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to go to the city. Well, I guess I'm not commuting every day because uh, of the. I'm virtually logging on. Right. So, okay. So now, if you want to become someone like a superintendent, mm-hmm. you have. Do you first have to get your teaching? You first have to be a teacher. And then on top of the teacher, you have to get your well, you don't administ- have to get him. You don't have to be a teacher? To be a superintendent? No. Got it. So you can be you can go and get your administration degree because um, they have like uh, – there is the financial aspect of it too. So you can be a, like the Susan Casali who does uh, – she wasn't a teacher. She was an accountant. So she went into that route through that, that end, and she does all the business stuff. She's the business uh, associate there. The, uh, she's an associate superintendent. Um, her job is probably the hardest in the district because she's got to make sure. And I got to be honest with you, I've worked in many districts and I did my internship in that field because I did end up getting that degree. Uh, she's probably the best I've ever seen. Where? What, what's her background? Finance. You know, she was an accountant. Got but, it. Uh, she is uh, – kids in our district get exactly what they need and she's very fiscally responsible. So it, 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 that's a tough balance. It's a tough balance. Yeah yeah but but to, she couldn't teach though she would have to go and get her correct. teaching masters correct is that a miss like what if someone has like 30 years of like experience in finance she can't have a, any any class to teach kids finance like she still has to get a master's degree you have to be able to get your certification in teaching in order to teach in the school you, uh, with the pandemic, they were allowing like two classes outside of it because they couldn't get enough teachers because we had to have such small sizes. That's going to go away again. I mean, I anticipate. So I, you do need to have uh, your your teaching license and degree. Got it. Got it. Do you think that? Uh, do you think that if you aren't, and let me ask you this: if you weren't a teacher, do you think that you would have been as good as a principal? No, definitely not. Definitely not. It, you, you need to understand one of the most valuable things you could do in, as you progress into leadership roles is to have walked in the shoes of the people you're leading. And you have to and you have to be willing to lead by example. Not, you know, you're not going to lead from the back saying, you know, go this way. 
into the, you know, into the woods, you're going to be the first one going in. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's in my, when I started off with this, I was like, you connected with everyone and no, everyone loved you. The, the teachers loved you. The kids sure loved they're... you. <laughs> um, yeah. So you've walked in the shoes of the teachers. I'm, I'm sure that has to help. I mean, it, yeah. not just only with the respect you get from teachers, but also being able to like uh, administer, ad administer, administer, I don't know what the hell the verb would be, operate a minute in administration that has teachers. It would be good to know how teaching is like to walk in their shoes. Yeah. I mean, you have to understand the struggles. You can never forget the struggles that people are going through. Uh, and that's, you know, I think a difficult part as you start to step away and move into district office administration, because you're not in with kids every day, at least as a principal, you're still there with, with students. So I think it's essential to get back to the buildings a lot to see what teachers and students are dealing with. Uh, as a principal, I spent a lot of time in the classrooms, you know, sitting down, watching classes for no other reason other than when I have a conversation with a parent about, well, why is this happening in the class? I'm just like, well, I sat in that class. I know exactly why. Well, do the kids still act up when you're in the class? Uh, no, not as much. I can tell you. Discipline-wise, at schools, it's very rare that there's problems in classrooms. Very rare. Most of the stuff happens outside the school now. Or really? Always. Yeah, it's a, it's, oh. a different, it's a different world. You know, it's uh, – it, I don't know why. It just is. You know, it, it's well, great. Well, because I remember that – when I, I was in a class, I don't remember the teacher or anything, but I think Dr. Rella sat in one of the classrooms because he was like doing a review for one of the teachers. Right. And me as a teenager, I think, you know, I wasn't <laughs> the most well behaved. But for this for this class, I was like, all right, I really like this teacher. I'm going to like be on my best behavior. And that's the key, Chris. And so everything was fine. But if you were to sit in the class, like for, for my examples, you might not see some people's behavior by sitting in the classroom, unless it's so obvious. It's like, you know what? I know he's behave. I know he or she is behaving right now, but I'm going to go walk out the classroom and see what they're doing and, and, and really know what the hell's going on here. Yeah. There's a big difference between being a goofball and being <laughs> disrespectful. Yeah. You would never disrespectful. No. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you, you know, like as the principal, I didn't need to go into the classroom to know which students were going to be, you know, cause a little bit of a disruption or which, which teachers are going to, you know, take the easy road. You know that before you go in, you know, but you, you had a comment there. That was the key. You liked the teacher. So you weren't going to do anything. And that is, that is the, the foundation of successful education. That's the relationship piece I'm talking about. You would work harder for that teacher because you cared about how they looked. And that is, that's the salesmanship of the teacher. They have to sell it to you. They have to get you to buy in. And that's why virtual education is really not the answer. The, you know what the funny thing is? <laughs> the teacher had the choice of picking two classes for Dr. Rella to sit in on. <laughs> and she, the other class was worse than us. She picked <laughs> I pick, pick out a couple of people that were in those classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but again, but as a teacher, like you're saying it now, don't think for a second that when you have the conversation with them, they're laughing the same way because it, it's, it's part of life. You know, that's part of the, that's part of the career. You know, you're going to have to deal with different types of personalities and that's what makes it exciting. Sometimes it's the challenge of, okay, I know Chris, you're not going to be totally focused and bought in, but I'm going to get you to buy in. That's the challenge. And when I do, there's nothing greater. Yeah. Once you pass that, once you hit that chemistry, it changes completely just with Absolutely. human relationships and connecting with people. It's so much easier to do that in person. There is no substitution for it. Yeah. It, it's really the essential piece. We have, we have a funny thing uh, going on at the office because we we're all working from home. Most of the people are working from home. And we're all like – we've during the pandemic, job market is so weird right now. But during the pandemic, um, everyone's looking for people and no one's coming. So, um, so you, people are getting really nice pay bumps and people are – so a lot of people have left the company. And then, I, and then we've had to get more people in. So a lot of people, so we have a whole brand new team that has never met each other. Right. 
And we're all like, we're all cu- we've seen each other's faces, but we're all curious curious how tall we all are when we get in the office. It's like <laughs> it's gonna be like an awkward like thing where it's like, what the f- what's this going works, on? This works out very well for me, who's vertically challenged. So <laughs> <laughs> vertically challenged, not horizontally. You got you you're beefed up right there. Yeah, well, I was horizontally challenged too, then I guess. <laughs> I don't know how the hell you work out six days a week. Uh, listen, it's uh, let me tell you. One of the things that I've learned about success has nothing to do with money. It has to do with balance. Success is all about balance in your life. It's about being able to go to your job and do the best you can at your job, but also spend time with your family and your friends and balance that all out. Uh, And I had a tough time trying to find balance with my older daughter because she has a friend, she has a boyfriend, she has school. She's a, you know, athlete looking to go to a division one college for, for athletics. Um, so it was, it was hard to find time. One of the things that we connected with was fitness. She wanted to go to the gym. I joined her up, signed her up with me. And uh, for the past year and a half, almost two years, we've been going together almost every day. Uh, that's our time together. It's our quality father-daughter time. So so before that, you were, you, were you not going to the gym as frequently? You're short and pudgy. <laughs> gotcha. So basically, the reason why you look so good is because your daughter – Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Maybe my daughter is only five months right now, but maybe when she's 17, she'll get me back into shape. I am in bad shape right now. Uh, listen, you have an infant at home. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait till she's like three and she's eating your food and you're like, oh, you're not going to finish that. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's going to be, it's so funny. What'd you say? It's a blessing and she's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, every t- every time I talk to someone about this, I, I just first kid, so it is so strange, but so amazing. It's like I can't find the right word to describe it, but to see another living human being that is half of you because they have half of your like DNA, and it, and they're you but half, but growing up to a person and developing a personality, it is so strange and awesome. Uh, I love her to death. It's it's incredible. Yeah, it's yeah. nothing. There's nothing like, and and as she gets older, every day you'll love her more and more. It's it, there's nothing like a father daughter relationship. It's it's the greatest yeah. thing. I'm trying and to get, get her. Good. I'm trying to get her to say dad first. Yeah, not I, mom. Did, I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it'll work. Actually, I heard it's easier to say dad dad based it on is. like so. Yeah. So maybe you, I'll get it. You might get it. <laughs> Make sure you record it so you can always remind yeah. everyone. <laughs> Although I might get a sucker punch if, if for my wife if that happens. It'd be, it'd be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you eat healthy? Like do you you work out every day? Do you also eat healthy? I, I try to. It's not always easy. You know, uh, I still eat like uh, everything in moderation. Um I uh you know, try to stick to like some salads and, and proteins and chicken and, but you know, I'm a sucker for chicken wings and yeah. I can eat chicken wings and burgers every day. If I, if, if I could, I would. What about coffee? Do you have coffee? Yeah, I do a cup a day. Yeah. I'm like, I have an addictive personality. Once I have one coffee, I need like more. It's crazy. Yeah. That's the one thing I do not have. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know what any. We've been going for fifty minutes. Anything else you got? What else is going on in your life? You're uh, you're working out like a goddamn champ. <laughs> you're innovating the school. What else could you do? What else, what else are you doing? Right now, I'm just focusing on my kids. They're getting older. Spending as much time with them. Uh, focusing on my career and my friends. Like I said, that it's it's all about successes being you know balanced. Um. I'm fortunate enough to work with, with really good people. So when you talk about like, you know, innovating a district, there's so many people that bring great ideas to the district and we're just a collaborative team. Nothing that ever happens there is because of one person. It never is. Um, I don't think it's ever been, it's always been a collaboration. You know, things that I did at the high school, I remember thinking to myself, all right, I want to try this out. First person I would call be Dr. Eller or Dr. Quinn and be like, Hey, you know, this is my thought. And, you just got the encouragement to do it. Um, so it, 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 it kind of fosters an environment of how can we grow? What can we do next? How can we be better? 
because you kind of get a high off of that, you know, that, that successful experience, you want to replicate it over and over because you see the impact it has on kids. And that's the benefit of working at the district we're in is having that support. Let me ask you this. You may not be able to answer it, but who, we'll see. What was your most memorable moment at the school? And what was your most challenging time? Biggest moment and like the hardest moment. Oof. Um, Could be a hard one to answer. We got a lot of moments going on. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. When I first interviewed, I'll never forget it. Uh, I was sitting in the boardroom and uh, Dr. Rella came out and introduced himself to me. We had a conversation. He had a call. I listened to the call. He said to me, what, you know, here's my scenario. He called everybody Bub. He said, here's my scenario, Bub. What do you think? <laughs> we had a conversation. He's like, that's exactly what I'm going to do. We went in. We did an interview. I sat there, talked to everybody. He walked me out. We had conversations. And I'll never forget going home and I called my parents. And my dad was always my mentor. My dad's probably my best friend. I was very fortunate to have very supportive parents. My parents are absolutely amazing. Um, I don't even know how they put up with me their whole lives. They should have put me up for a doctor. <laughs> um, or just threw me in the dumpster. I don't know. But uh, I remember calling my father and he said, how did, how did the interview go? I said to my father, I said, I think I interviewed with you. You know, it was like, he was like my father. And that was the relationship that Joe and I had from that moment on. And so did everybody else that knew Joe. You know, he was just one of those people that took you under his wing and he connected with you and just made you feel like you were part of his family. And that was what I think we always try to, you know, replicate there. So that was probably my most memorable moment. The fact that I had the opportunity to work in a place that cared that much. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty special. It was probably my, my most terrifying moment as well, you know, stepping into a role as a leader from being a teacher in a new district, in a community I didn't know. Um, you know, it's, it's scary. It's the unknown. Yeah. Would you just like your first couple of years, you just have to work your ass off hard to get the respect. It seems like you got the respect pretty quickly. I think respect comes like you earn it, but it's about just being genuine, you know, treat the easiest thing you could do. And the most, the best way to be successful as an administrator or a teacher is you treat every kid like they're yours. If you have children, how would you want your kid to be treated? And if you do that, you really can't make a mistake. You see me? You, you're... Yep, yep, yep. You froze uh, up for a second, but you're back. You froze. What was your hardest moment, though? Was that the was that the hardest moment too? Get in there. I, I think yeah. I think making that transition, you know, you get comfortable in a place, and it's a you, it's nerve wracking to make a change. Um, over the yeah. years, I've grown to I've grown to love change now. Um, I didn't always, uh, change can be invigorating. It can be one of the, the greatest, you know, factors in, in growth and success. Um, but you have to embrace it. You know, you have to be willing to say, okay, I'm going here because this is what I want to do. You know, I, this is the impact I want to have. And if you don't make change, it, it doesn't happen sometimes. Yeah. And you miss out on opportunities. My br my older brother has like an uncanny ability to change jobs and be totally fine. Like, and like, I don't think I have that quality. It's a little scary. You have if you're in an established place, you have respect from people. People know who you are. You have the relationships, and now you go to a completely new thing, new place. It's the uncertainty that that crawls into your head. Like, what the? What if? What if no one likes me? What if I do my job hardly? Will I lose my my way to support my family? Right, but you have to remember the skills that helped you build in the relation in the career you're in and the place you're in are the same skills you're going to use there. You know, it's <laughs> it, you have the ability because you did it already. Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes it's, it's hard. Getting yeah. into that mindset. Yeah. What would be? We'll we'll leave off leave off with this. I, I like to ask a lot of people this, but you, it's it's really just a summary, maybe, of what you already told me. What are three things that you tell any tell someone to do to be successful in their lives? It doesn't have to be someone who's trying to be administrator. Just anybody, anyone that from the challenges, obstacles, learnings you've had in your life. What are the three things that you would say to do? Uh, be empathetic. Understand where people are coming from. Connect with that. Um, because it makes it so much easier 
to make decisions when you really understand people. Um, be appreciative. You know, thank you. Uh, almost every graduation speech I ever gave was about making sure you say thank you. Sometimes a little handwritten note. You know, don't lose th that fundamental of being appreciative for what people do. Even if it's a small little gesture, it may be small to you, but it may have taken a lot for them to do it. So showing that appreciation, let me tell you, when you say thank you, people will be back more and more to get your back and help you out even more. So I think empath empathy, being appreciative, and, uh, and just hard work, you know, uh, find what you love and work hard at it because it doesn't feel like work when you, when you love it. If you could do those three things in life, you got it. Beautiful. I love it. Well, it was good catching up with you. I've seen you, you on, in the past month now. It's three times. Three times we've seen each what? other. Are you getting like sick it, of me? Right? No, not at all yet. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were done with me in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> now, my goal, my goal would be, as the principal, to never be done with anybody. You know, you guys are part of us forever. We're family. I love it. Well, yeah, I'm going to be – I'll be around more and more because I got more books to, to print. And my, I'll tell you what my goal is. My goal is I want, I want one of these books in every single one of your graduating class in 2022. We'll see if that I happens. Well, we're looking at we're looking at some ninth grade stuff and how to implement it into a ninth grade class. So Got we're it. talking about that now. So we'll, we'll be we'll be talking a lot because uh, we have some really good ideas. I love it. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Chris, thanks for having. Me. Yes, I appreciate it, man. It's Thank always you. Great seeing you. Yeah, thanks for here just hearing me out. Um, it you know what? Same thing with Rella and your all your mentors. I came to you with an idea about a book and you were totally open to it. So. You know, that's, uh, I appreciate, I just appreciate that, that you would even be willing to take your time out of your day to listen to me, look at the book, take a look at it, consider it for your kids and, and somehow weaving it into the curriculum. That's just, uh, thank you for that because it is my mission too, to give people inspiration and information so they can live better lives. And so thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for hearing me out. And Maybe I'll see you in another week or so. Who knows? You're never getting rid of me, I guess. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to bring the baby so I can see the baby. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the baby steals the moment every time. She's the talk of the oh, show. Yeah. She will for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Mr. Kniggs. Thanks for coming on. Chris, great seeing you. Great talking. Yep. I'll talk to you soon. Yep, talk to you later. Bye. Bye.